Okay, welcome, and we are continuing our discussion of Descartes. Uh, we went from knowing nothing, uh, and Descartes is going to supposedly get everything back for us, so we're going to go from nothing to everything uh, in the course of six days. Some people have wondered if that's a reference to the book of Genesis. I'll leave that to you to figure out for yourself. Uh, but uh, to think about where we've been with Descartes' meditations, uh, think about it this way. Uh, at the start of Meditation 6, uh, we do know that the mind exists, right? Uh, I think, therefore, I am, as it's sometimes characterized. Uh, so you know that you yourself exist. And we also found in Meditation 3 uh, that God exists. So we know that there is some infinitely perfect uh, being, uh, which is the cause of me and would be the cause of anything else in this world. Uh, not only did he bring us into existence, but he keeps us in existence. Um, and Descartes gave us a couple of arguments uh, as to why we should believe in the existence of God. Uh, one in Meditation 3, one in Meditation 5. Uh, we also uh, get this idea that's sometimes referred to as the truth rule, uh, the truth rule tells us that when we have clear and distinct perceptions, uh, that's going to be a reliable guide for finding certain and indubitable knowledge. Uh, right? So the idea of a clear and distinct idea, this is recognizing things that couldn't not uh, be true. Uh, couldn't not, so it's a double negative there. Another way to put that would be it's recognizing things that have to be true. So the first example of something that has to be true is that given your evidence, you know that you have to exist, right? That's an idea that is a clear and distinct perception. Uh, when we're thinking about clarity, we're thinking about a necessary connection that you are perceiving. And when we're thinking about distinct perceptions, it's like using the right terms for the category, right? So you would be having an indistinct perception if you attributed weight to things that couldn't possibly have weight at all, right? So a thought, Descartes thinks, can have weight. Uh, so it's using our concepts in a responsible way to perceive necessary connections. That's what we're thinking about when we think about clear and distinct perceptions, uh, which are supposed to be our guide to indubitable knowledge. Now, we haven't gotten the whole world back yet, right? Because at this point, we just have our mind. Uh, you know, sometimes the term solipsism is used to describe people who think that only their own minds exist. So we get to solipsism uh, in book two, but we get out of solipsism uh, with book three and five, uh, where we establish the existence of God. Uh, but we still have a lot more to prove, right? Because, for instance, I don't know, this die that's sitting here on my desk. Well, this particular comically large die uh, is neither me nor is it God. Uh, and it seems like we would be led to a pretty large degree of skepticism uh, if we couldn't know that things in the world other than ourselves and God exist. Uh, so uh, that's what we're going to try to do in Meditation 6 establish that material things outside the mind exist. So I'm going to show you a proof uh, that Descartes gives us, uh, or at least an argument that he thinks counts as a proof, uh, that things outside the mind exist. Uh, so this shows up in a very long paragraph on page 123. I've streamlined some things. I've cut out some of the talk about uh, formal and eminent reality. We can set those things aside to understand the basics of the argument. Uh, here's Descartes' thought. Uh, first thing is, I have experiences of corporeal things. So, you know, like, I have an experience of this die as a thing that is corporeal. And when he uses this word corporeal, it just means material. And you might remember from earlier in the meditations that Descartes says, well, when we think about what it is for a thing to be material, or in other words, yet again, to be body, 
what we're thinking about that thing is that it's essentially extended, right? So to be extended is to be a 3D object. So it's going to have a certain uh, height and a certain width and a certain depth, right? Uh, and we can also talk about uh, being extended as excluding other things from that space. So when I move this die into this particular location, it excludes some air uh, that used to be there. Um, and, uh, you know, we can talk about uh, the motion of the die in terms of, for instance, its uh, changes in uh, its particular location in extended space. This is all to say, we have experiences of material, corporeal, extended things. So here's uh, how Descartes is going to prove that not only do we have ideas or experiences of these things, but we actually uh, can know that the objects of these experiences actually exist. Uh, first thought. I would be unable to sense corporeal things unless some faculty existed as well, either in me or in some other substances capable of producing or forming these ideas. This should actually be pretty uh, familiar from Meditation 3, where he said, look, uh, you have the idea of many things, and those ideas are about certain things and ideas that are, say, about substances have to be caused by substances, uh, and so on and so forth. So ideas come from somewhere, um, and depending on what they're about, we can even narrow in our explanation of where they come from. Okay, so, uh, first thing he says is, either in me or some other substance. Then he says, this active faculty clearly cannot exist within me because it presupposes no intellectual, excuse me, intellectual activity at all, and because without my cooperation and often even against my will, it produces these ideas. So first thought, he's saying the idea of a corporeal thing, like when we perceive this die in my hand, well, he's going to say you're not just making that up because oftentimes uh, we experience certain corporeal objects that are not uh, things that we cho choose to make up. He also points out that uh, there's nothing inherently intellectual about a sense experience of a die. That's sort of like a physical thing that happens to you, Descartes seems to be saying. Uh, but what you are is a purely intellectual being. That's what we learned in meditation too. Uh, so we're going to say, look, uh, an intellectual being could not uh, be the full explanation of a corporeal, uh, the idea of a corporeal thing. Okay, so uh, the idea of corporeal things is not sourced in me. So he says the substance must be either a body, a corporeal thing, that is something with corporeal nature, or it must be God. So those are the two hypotheses left. And Descartes says, but since God is not a deceiver, it is very evident that he does not transmit these ideas uh, to me from himself directly. For since he has given me no faculty whatsoever for recognizing such a source, but by contrast has endowed me with a powerful tendency to believe that these ideas are sent out from corporeal things, I do not see how it could be possible to not think of him as a deceiver if these ideas were sent out from any other source than corporeal things. Okay, so there's a lot going on there. Main idea is, look, either it's God or something other than God. Uh, the thing other than God would be corporeal reality. And he then goes on to say, if God were the cause of my ideas of corporeal reality, he does use this word directly, because God is the cause of both me and everything else that exists, like, I don't know, this die, right? He's going to say, God is not the direct source um, of these ideas. Now, he says, if, uh, if God were the source of these ideas, uh, this would be the kind of experience that we'd never be able to recognize, 
right? Sometimes you can improve your sensory experiences uh, by having further sensory experiences, right? You might be looking at a tree across the street and think it's an oak tree, but then you get up closer and examine a number of features and realize, oh no, it's a maple, right? So that's a way in which uh, you can recognize uh, your errors uh, or get really clear on what the source of your ideas is. But if God were just creating our ideas of reality, we wouldn't be able to like look closer at our perceptions and realize that God is the source. Kind of like how we could look closer at a tree and realize that it's a maple, right? And so Descartes is gonna say, uh, given that situation, it would be a deception if God were the direct source of our idea of corporeal things, right? And he's going to say that would be deceptive, but God, a perfect being, is no deceiver. Uh, so this leaves us with one final explanation, right? Uh, our ideas of corporeal things are caused by corporeal things themselves. Now, one thing that we try to do as philosophers sometimes is we try to take a block of text like this and then convert it into an argument, like step by step, right? So that's what I've done for you here on this next uh, slide. So you can tell me uh, if you think that I've missed a point or given an unfair characterization of Descartes' argument here. Uh, but this is my best crack at it, uh, at least for now. Uh, it's going to say, uh, my idea of corporeal things must be sourced from either me, some other substance, or God. Two, I am not the source of my idea of material reality. One. Thinking things can't uh, be the source of ideas of material things, he seems to think. Plus, my ideas about material reality often come against my will. Oftentimes I experience it raining without uh, me wanting it raining. So it doesn't seem like it's a figment of my willing imagination. Three, if God were the direct source of my idea of corporeal things, I would be deceived. Uh, that was the whole point about it would be an undetectable error. And a loving God wouldn't set us up so that we would err even when we're using our faculties as responsibly and carefully as possible. But God is no deceiver. So God is not the direct source of my idea of corporeal things. And sometimes in arguments also, we can also point out that it seems like five uh, is... Uh, a logical consequence of three and four. So it says, if God were the source, I'd be deceived, but I'm not deceived. Uh, so uh, this basically has the structure, if P then Q, not Q, therefore not P, right? That kind of argument is sometimes called modus tollens. Uh, so we can know that God is not the direct source of my idea of corporeal things. Uh, based on this no deceiver rule. So we can conclude my idea of corporeal things is sourced in a substance other than me or God. So that's going to follow from the idea that uh, my thought about corporeal substance must be from one of three things, right? Uh, me, God, or something else. So we've ruled out me and we've ruled out God and uh, we're left with this last possibility that something else other than me or God uh, is the source of my idea of corporeal things. That follows from this, that, or the other thing, not this, not that, so it must be the other thing. That's the argument that we get from one, two, and five. One of three things, not the first thing, not the second thing, so therefore the third thing. And he also suggests, right towards the end, that if the substance were sourced from something other than corporeal matter, God would be deceiving me. Uh, so, uh, there exists corporeal matter, which explains my idea of corporeal matter. Uh, that means, like, God is no deceiver, um, and I'm not being deceived by God. So again, uh, by modus uh, tollens, uh, we can... Uh, we can be sure that um, it has to be the case that corporeal reality explains my idea of corporeal matter.
So that's my take on that argument. But, so if we think about at the start of Meditation 6, we didn't know that corporeal reality existed, now we do. So of course the challenge here now is, if you think that this is a weak argument, uh, figure out which of these uh, seven premises that you'd want to deny in order to uh, resist uh, Descartes' conclusion. Or maybe you agree with his conclusion. Most people do agree that material reality exists, but you might think that you've got a better way of making this argument than Descartes does. Now, the question that is the title of this is, uh, does material reality exist? Uh, but also, if it does, what's its nature? And uh, here's Descartes' answer. It's kind of an interesting or a strange one. At least it goes against some people's common sense. So Descartes' answer is going to be that material reality is clearly and distinctly perceived as the object of pure mathematics. Now, a way of putting this is that to be an object of pure mathematics is to be something that takes up space. Remember, I just talked about extension as uh, you know, a way of talking about things that take up space. But we can also think about this in terms of the quantitative features of things. If something is taking up space, we could map that out uh, you know, on some kind of grid or on some kind of spreadsheet exactly which spaces um, each material thing is taking up, how it's moving through material space, so on and so forth. Um, those are what we might think of as extension and the quantitative features of things. That's how to think clearly and distinctly about material objects and what they really are. Right? But Descartes thinks that we're not clearly and distinctly perceiving material reality when we just let our senses tell us what things are. So sometimes we talk about what a thing is in terms of its heat perception or its smell or its taste or our color perception of it. So we might contrast these quantitative things uh, about a thing, you know, stuff that could be entered into a spreadsheet in a very precise way versus the qualitative features of a thing. Uh, that is like its smell or how hot it feels to you. So we might ask, why treat material beings as an object of pure mathematics? Well, one thing that we get from Descartes is a really important and interesting distinction, and this is the distinction between imagining and understanding. So when we're thinking about imagining something, that is forming a mental image of something with your mind's eye. So kind of what you're doing is like maybe you close your eyes and you um, sort of to imagine is to picture something. And in fact, uh, Descartes would even use the term to think about sense experience in general. That, you know, whether it's closing your eyes and conjuring something up or looking at the thing, you know, we're going to be imagining it in the sense that we are forming a mental image of this thing in our mind's eye, right? Descartes says that's not the only way that you can think about things. Another way that you can think about things is through the act of understanding. So Descartes is going to say, unlike imagining, uh, this is a mental act which is not sensory, right? So part of what your mind does is to sense and experience the world around us, but that's not all the thinking that you do, right? Uh, oftentimes when we're understanding something, we are thinking in terms of the essences of things, right? So I don't know, I'm drinking from a cup of coffee right now. I can imagine it, uh, you know, by taking a drink and experiencing the temperature and the aromas and the various uh, you know, pleasant flavors that I get from drinking this cup of black coffee. But understanding, you know, we might say like to understand the black coffee, um, I would have to think in terms of like what this coffee really is. So Descartes would have thought about this in terms of the physics he was working with at the time, in terms of corpuscles of matter. 
That is like little arrangements, packets of matter that fit together in certain ways, that are moving in certain ways, that are going to uh, constitute what the coffee in my cup is, right? Uh, whereas in contemporary terms, you know, we might think about uh, the coffee in this cup as being comprised of a bunch of atoms in motion. Uh, you know, we might explain some of the flavors that I'm getting in terms of certain organic chemical compounds. Right. So Descartes is going to make this distinction between, uh, you know, when we think about materiality in terms of how we imagine it versus understanding it. Uh, and this image will become clear in a second. Now, it's often uh, quite easy to mix these things up to imagine something and understand something because oftentimes uh, we can both imagine a thing and understand the thing at the same time. Uh, so for instance, think about your idea of triangles, right? Uh, and you know, part of what you could say about your idea of triangles is how you imagine triangles, the mental image. You know, so if you are experiencing a triangle, let's just make one out of this piece of paper here. Right? So if I'm imagining a triangle, we could just say like, you know, it's looking at or thinking about triangles and, you know, we could close our eyes and think about equilateral triangles and right triangles and uh, obtuse triangles and so forth. Right? That's imagining a triangle. Descartes says there's another thing you can do to think about triangles and it's not to form any mental pictures. Uh, but instead, it's to think about what it is to be a triangle, right? So this is going back to thinking in terms of the essences of things. So you can understand triangles uh, by saying like, look, now by understanding a triangle, you are thinking about a 2D, three-sided, three-angled, closed figure in Euclidean space, right? We can also like come to understand certain things about triangles. Um, if we, you know, sit down with our math teachers and learn some proofs, we could learn some proofs for the Pythagorean theorem, or we could learn some proofs uh, that the internal angles would add up to 180. Or you might learn, for instance, uh, that the longest side of a triangle is always opposite the largest angle, right? Uh, the small angles won't have uh, the long side opposite them. Uh, you can actually come to know that through understanding and in a way that's more comprehensive and more complete uh, than our idea of a triangle. But we mix these things up because we can both understand what a triangle is and imagine one pretty easily. But here's where it gets a little trickier. Think about the idea of, and Descartes calls this a kiliagon. It looks sort of like it's pronounced chiliagon. I think that's okay to say too. I've learned it as chiliagon, right? So we can also think about our idea of the chiliagon. So when you understand a chiliagon, uh, what you're doing is you are thinking about um, a figure with a certain amount of sides. You know, like a triangle is a three-sided figure, and a square is a four-sider, and a pentagon is a five-sider, octagon, dodecahedron, and so on and so forth. Well, an understanding of the kiliagon is to think about a figure uh, that doesn't have like eight, like an octagon, it has a thousand sides, right? So no more, no less, it is a figure with a thousand sides. You know, with our understanding of that, we could actually figure out like what the angle is between them. You know, like we're dealing with 60 on a triangle and 90 on a perfect square, so on and so forth. We could work out the angles um, when it comes to what the angles of an equilateral kiliagon would be. Um, and we could also, um, you know, we could also, um, do a number of like mathematical proofs about the kiliagon. Here's the thing, when we go to imagining, you cannot distinguish the kiliagon from many other figures, 
Right. So this allegedly is a picture of the Kiliagon that I've pulled off the internet. So you might be able to see like a little faint red line uh, right around. And that would be the red line that's connecting all the different parts. And these sort of faint lines coming into the middle are all the lines from the center to each point. Right. So there we go. Uh, you are looking at that image. If we have not been misled by the internet, uh, then you know you are ha imagining you are having a sensory experience of a kiliagon. Now maybe the fact that we can't be sure we're looking at a kiliagon is instructive, right? If you were looking at a 999 uh, sided figure, I don't know what the name of that is, but let's call it a Kili minus one agon, or if you were looking at a 1001 sided figure, we'll call that the Kili plus one agon, right? You wouldn't be able to distinguish those two in your imagination. So, in that way, uh, our thinking is no longer distinct, right? We are no longer keeping uh, one category of things, the Kiliagons. Uh, separate from the other categories of things, Kili plus one-agons, Kili minus one-agons, and so forth. Right? So Descartes is going to say, you don't really understand things just by forming a mental image of them in your head. So imagining is not a good way to have clear and distinct perceptions of things. Understanding is. Uh, maybe I'll give you one other example uh, that might help us to like read Descartes in a way uh, that like helps him with one of his problems. In Meditation 3, Descartes says, we have an infinite idea of God. Uh, and it's that recognition that God is an infinite being that allows us to infer that that infinite being is the cause of our idea of God. Many people have asked Descartes, well, if it's an infinite idea, you couldn't fit that into your tiny mortal brain, right? It'd be kind of like putting an oversized file onto a computer. Uh, that would probably just, you know, not work or make the computer explode. Now that's trying to fit every little detail about God uh, into your idea of God. And I think that Descartes would willingly admit that we don't have to perceive every single feature of God in order to have an idea of God. Uh, so that might be like the problems with trying to imagine the nature of God. But if we are just understanding God, right, if we are recognizing that God is a being with certain kinds of perfections, uh, one that's very important for Descartes' argument there, is that God is a necessarily existent and self-sufficient being. Uh, that is an understanding, a definition, a recognition of an essence um, that we can fit into our mortal brains. So we might think in this way that uh, this distinction for, between imagining and understanding uh, is a helpful way of getting a grip on some of Descartes' uh, subtler points uh, throughout uh, his thought. So now that we've got this distinction between imagining and understanding in mind, uh, Descartes is going to say that sensations, these are acts of the imagination, they are not going to represent objects in the external world as they really are. Uh, He's going to say that our experiences of things like color and heat and flavor and pain, he's going to say we represent color and heat and flavor and pain as like essences or substances that flow through certain objects. Uh, but uh, if we understand what color, heat, flavor, or pain really are, uh, we'll realize that uh, it's a mistake to think about these ways of being, sort of modes of other substances, Descartes going to say that is ways that a substance can present itself or be for a short amount of time. He's going to say when we think about, say, heat or flavor or color as its own substance, uh, we are not thinking distinctly. We're applying terms, substantiality, uh, to a thing that isn't a substance at all. 
So we can think that for Descartes, um, when we're thinking about these qualities like color or heat or flavor or pain, uh, those are more experiences within yourself than they are real true features of a thing. Right? We can actually say that this view is quite compatible with and complementary to uh, the new physics of Galileo and others. That if you want to think about reality, think about it mathematically. Uh, Galileo was also an advocate for the corpuscularian view of reality, which was that precursor to the atomic theory of matter. Uh, so uh, for Galileo, but also for Descartes, uh, they are going to say that when you're doing physics, uh, you should not be thinking in terms of all the Aristotelian categories of causation. So you can think about efficient causes. This is like the explanation of matter in motion, certain textures bumping up to and interacting with other material things. You should do that in physics, but you should not think in terms of final causes, the purposes of things, the formal causes, the essences of different types of things is like a fundamental building block of reality. Uh, nor should you think about material causes. Um, remember that was like Aristotle's idea that we had four prime elements, you know, earth, air, fire, and water, right? Uh, so Descartes is going to be friendly to the idea that actually heat or uh, flavor is not an inherent quality of things. Color is not an inherent quality of things, but it's our reaction to these things, right? So these experiences are not things. They're ways our mind is affected by things. So Descartes points out on page 124 of our volume Oh, it's not near me. Of our <coughs> excuse me, of our volume uh, edited by Shapiro and Lascano. Uh, on 124, he says it's false that white or green substance uh, that that in a white or green thing there is the same essence of whiteness or greenness like flowing through the thing in itself. Rather, to be white is just to affect your eyes in a way that gives you experiences of white things. That's all there is to it for Descartes. And in this way, we can also think about what Descartes is doing. His picture of material reality is quite compatible with what the new scientists were doing. Descartes was very interested in and impressed by uh, thinkers like uh, Copernicus and Galileo and all the advances in science that they were making. So even though Descartes is arguing for what some of you might think of as rather traditional views, you know, the traditional idea that there is a God and we have a mind that will continue to exist after our body dies. Uh, these are sort of like official Catholic doctrine in a big way. Uh, Descartes uh, is trying to make that sort of official Catholic doctrine friendly to the new physics of Galileo. Uh, so that's sort of like a side way of interpreting the importance and also motivations of uh, what's going on in Descartes' meditations. Here's the last question. You might think like, wouldn't God be a deceiver if he's giving us these experiences of, say, greenness and essence or substance of greenness being within green things and so on and so forth? Or hotness being a substance like an effluvium or an effervescence that like flows through one object and into another when we have heat transfer. Uh, well, Descartes is going to say, yeah, these experiences are motions in us, right? Each of these motions uh, create in the part of the brain which immediately affects the mind, introduces it into one particular sensations. Sensate only one particular sensation. So it's like for each kind of thing that can happen to you, uh, you know, when coffee hits my mouth, it's going to create a particular kind of sensation. That particular distinctive sensation of, you know, bitterness and aromaticness and warmth uh, that only comes from coffee. Uh, and that only coffee can please me in that way, right? 
Now, when we have a particular sensation uh, tied to particular things, uh, that sensation serves to protect human health as effectively and frequently as possible. So for instance, Descartes is going to say, look, we have our minds and our bodies. And he's actually going to say that the union of the mind and the body, well, that's what it is to be a human being. Uh, it's to be an ensouled body, right? So when your body has a soul to go with it, um, that's what it is to be a person. And having experiences of things with colors or temperatures or being painful or pleasant, well, those are going to be things that help you navigate the world, keep your body alive, keep it connected uh, to your soul or your mind, at least for now. Right? And in that way, Descartes is going to say, look, these sensations aren't really tricking us. Right? Uh, so we can think carefully and thoughtfully about what the bitterness or warmth of coffee really is. And I could say, well, it's certain... Uh, certain physical things and certain arrangements of physical motion. And I also know that coffee is, uh, when I have these sensations, it's going to be a non-poisonous and also invigorating beverage that's going to help me uh, do my work and uh, stay energetic. Right. So we can avoid confused and indistinct sensation uh, when we realize that uh, we are having the sensory experiences we're having for a certain reason. These are signals uh, that our body is sending us through imagination uh, to help keep the body healthy and interacting correctly uh, with the material world around us. Now this point about our minds and our bodies uh, being united together and our bodies navigating the material world, uh, that's going to lead us into our final question. So my next video about Descartes meditations is going to go back over meditation six and look at some of the arguments Descartes gives us uh, for the view that the mind and body really are separate things. We got a hint of an argument in meditation two, uh, but now here in meditation six, uh, we're going to get uh, the complete and final follow through of this other thing that Descartes was intending to prove with the meditations. Uh, which is that we have a true distinction between the mind and the body. So we'll continue things with that discussion uh, in a little bit. As always, uh, thanks for listening and be in touch if you have any questions or concerns. Take care.